You may be seated. Well, good morning, Restoration Church. Uh, my name is Jeff, and it's good to see you all here. Uh, whether you are new to church, maybe this is your first time in church. Uh, maybe uh, you've been visiting a while. Uh, maybe you have been a part of a, another church for a long time, and this is your first time here. Or maybe you're a covenant member of our church. You're all welcome, and it's great to see everybody here this morning. Um, you know, one of my favorite TV shows right now is a show called The Chosen. Who Raise your hand if you've seen that. It's a few. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a show about the life of Jesus. And in one of the episodes, he says to one of his followers, he says, get used to different. I don't know if there's actually people walking around with t-shirts now that say, get used to different. And I say that because I've been going to church now for, I don't know, over 30 years. And I've been involved and been a member of different churches. I've never been to a church until this one that took prayer so seriously. And I think for those of you who are part of this church, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so anyway, I, 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 I wanted to let you know that because every Sunday, and this is something different that not every church I've been to does. In fact, very few. In fact, none of the churches I went to in the past did this. <laughs> Um, we actually take time every Sunday morning, the Lord's Day, in prayer, right in the middle of the service. And so what we like to do is we have, we have a prayer of confession where we get one-on-one -on -one with God. And, and then we have a time of, of praying for our neighbors, perhaps the person sitting right next to you or behind you in the pew. And so... That's what we're going to do right now. That's what this section in the service is called. It's just called prayer. Um, so as it relates to our time of confession, the Lord keeps bringing me back to Isaiah 53. And I've read this scripture many times in the past, um, but since it was written 700 years before Christ came as a baby, think about that, 700 years before Christ came, this scripture was written. I usually remember it, and most people think of this scripture in terms of prophecy. There's lots of prophecy in the Bible talking about the Messiah who was to come. But as I read it today, I'd like for you to carefully hear it and, and place yourself in this. Take the position as one of the people that our Lord and Savior Jesus came to save. Put yourself in that, that person's shoes as I read this scripture. And I'm specifically going to read Isaiah 53, 1 through 6, and then verse 8. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. Did you do that? Did you put yourself there? You feel the weight of it? Let's pray. Lord, we confess that we, we don't deserve your mercy, your grace, your forgiveness, 
for your blessings. Every day we sin against you and others in our life. We are all transgressors. Our past is filled with iniquities. Like sheep, we have all gone astray and have turned to our own ways. So it is with immeasurable gratitude that we praise and worship you for going to the cross for us, consuming the wrath of God that we earned in your death, then defeating death and sin through your resurrection. We humbly ask for your Holy Spirit to do what only you can do. We want to realign our lives with you. Father, help us. Help us to fully surrender our hearts, minds, and souls to you for our good and especially for the glory of your name. Amen. So just please take a minute right now and just, just bow your head. Just get one-on-one -on -one with God in confession. As we see in Acts chapter 2, praying together and for one another was a common practice. And starting in verse 42 of Acts chapter 2, it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So at this time, if you are comfortable doing so, we encourage you to find somebody nearby and ask them how you can pray for them. And in addition to your neighbor's prayer request, please be in prayer. Please be in prayer for the Henry family. Uh, Justin's father, his name is David, and he's, he's going into hospice. Um, so as you're praying with your neighbor, please lift the Henry family, family up, and especially David, if you would. Thank you. Just take a couple of minutes right now and do that, please.
Father God, what a privilege it is to come to you at the foot of the cross this morning as we confessed our sins and then prayed for our friends, family, and neighbors. May the rest of our worship be genuine and the preaching of your word be faithful, true, and penetrating. Please be with our pastor. Fill him with your spirit and speak through him this morning. We love you. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So at this time, Kim is going to come up and share some important announcements with us. Good morning, y'all. How's everybody doing? Good. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Can I get an amen? Yes. Awesome. Okay, well, I just want to once again welcome everybody here, especially if you are a guest today, uh, whether you're a first-time guest or you visited a few times before, we would love to connect with you. There is a connect card in the back of the seat in front of you. If you'd fill that out and bring it out, David's holding it up for us. If you bring that out to our visitor tent outside, um, we have a little gift bag for you. And um, also on the back of that, there is a place where you can put a prayer request. This is for anyone. This place, we love to pray. So we would be honored to pray for you if you fill that out. I guarantee it will be prayed for. You will be prayed for. Uh, next, I want to tell you about how you can learn what's going on at Restoration Church because there's always a lot going on here. You're going to want to go onto the App Store or Google Play, and you're going to want to download the app called Church Center. And when you sign in to make your account, just look for Restoration Church of Sanford, and that's where you'll find out what's going on. So what's going on this week? We have a lot coming up. This Saturday is the Walk for Life. It's on March 26th. Uh, the Walk for Life benefits, woo, that's right. By the way, our, well, let me tell you about it first. Um, it's a fundraiser to benefit Thrive Orlando. Thrive Orlando is a Christ-centered medical cl clinic that equips people facing unplanned pregnancies to make life-affirming decisions. And as of this morning, Restoration Church is in the number two spot for fundraising. So <laughs> let's, th let's take number one, y'all. <laughs> Uh, so that's coming up next Saturday morning. You can register. There's actually a QR code that should be on the screen right now. If you scan that, you can register and you can join us. We have a big team that's going to be there helping and walking, and you can donate. Uh, the next day, March 27th, a week from today, is family service. So that means our kids from first grade and up will be in the service with us. We think it's really important for families to have the opportunity to worship together. So we look forward to seeing all of you and your kids as well next Sunday. Uh, the following week, April 1st and 2nd, is our Men and Women of the Word. The Men of the Word is Friday night, um, and the Women of the Word is Saturday morning, and it's just a time for the men and women to meet um, as a group, men together, women together. Uh, the men are studying 1 John, and the women are studying the book of Hosea, and it's going to be just a time to grow in the Lord and be equipped to learn and to teach and to fellowship with one another. And then lastly, um, on April 9th, that's the week before Easter, we're having something called Invite the Block. And from 10 till 1, we're going to be out in the neighborhood meeting our neighbors, praying for them, and inviting them to come visit us at Restoration Church of Sanford. So with that, uh, that's all that's coming up in the next couple weeks. Uh, next, we're going to move into a time of offering. And the Ushers are going to come forward in just a minute to pass the baskets. Um, you can also give through the app that I mentioned, and you can text any dollar amount to 84321. Um, so those are just the different ways that you can give. If you just bow your heads for just a minute, we'll pray over the offering. And yes, that's it. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are the creator and sustainer of every life in this room. Lord, every life in this world. Um, and you are also the one who gives abundant and eternal life to us. Lord, you are a good, good father, and we know that every good and perfect gift comes from you. Um, and so as we give back just a small amount of what you have given to us, Lord, God, I pray that you would bless it, that you would allow us to give it with generous hearts, and that it would be used for your kingdom, for your glory um, in our city. We love you so much because you first loved us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
such a beautiful song. Let me flip over here back to Romans because it ain't on Romans. So go ahead and turn with, uh, turn with me to Romans 1.16. I'm Don. It's good, to, it's good to be here this morning. I missed last week and, uh, and I really feel it in my spirit when I'm not in God's house. So it's great to be here this morning. And I was really thankful for the prayer time I was sharing with Willie and that, uh, Every day is a gift because I was flying back last week from Seattle seeing my son and I was a medical emergency on the airplane. Whew. But by God's grace, I'm here today. You know, the, 
James says, life is a vapor that appears for a moment and then is gone. So today's the day of salvation. So let's read Romans 1, 16 to 23. We have good news and we have bad news in this scripture from Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit. For I am, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungod ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Let me, let me pray as Pastor Arthur comes. Father, as human beings, we continually think, I continually think of ourself and myself more favorable than I should. In today's message, let, let us understand the magnitude of our sin. Let us see our need for the gospel and the fact that, is, that it is only by grace alone that we can be saved. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Glad to be here with you all this morning. If you are a guest with us, uh, we hope that you feel welcomed. We hope that you feel loved. Uh, we're a family, and we often say this, we're a broken family, a dysfunctional family, in need of God's grace, and so uh, grateful for the grace of God. The grace of God permeates everything we do because we are in desperate need of it, and we want to magnify the great grace of God this morning. Church family, I love you. Covenant members of this church, it is a privilege to shepherd you. It's an honor to preach the word of God with you and to you, and I pray that you know that this isn't my words. This is the very breath of God we're going to be hearing from this morning. The preacher's already preached. His name is God. And I'm just unpacking what God has already said. And hopefully I won't mess that up in the process. Amen. So we've been in the book of Romans for weeks now. And we preach expositionally here. We go verse by verse. Uh, we, we, there's a technical term called exegeting a text, which means that we interpret every word and every verse. We're careful to do that because all of God's word is inspired, right? And we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, book because that's what we believe God intended uh, for the church, is to read the Word of God in that way, in its context. And so we've been in the book of Romans for some time now. Uh, we're still in chapter 1, so you didn't miss too much. Um, but whatever you did miss, here's what you can do. You can go to our website, or even go on our app, Church Center app, Restoration Church, and you can see all of our previous messages to catch up, because context matters, Right? Having the context of a chapter, of a book, of a, all of that is extremely important because it's so easy to take a book or a verse or a passage out of context, and we don't, we don't want to do that. We want to honor the Lord. So now we're transitioning. Um, for the next three weeks, we're basically going to be looking at two ungodly exchanges that I believe characterize fallen, sinful man apart from the grace of God. The sinful exchange that we will see is the exchange of the glory of God for the glory of images of man and animals. And let's just call it what it is this morning, idolatry. <laughs> Exchanging the glory of God for idolatry. And that's specifically what we're going to focus on in our verses this morning. But the second ungodly exchange is the exchange of sexual relations with the opposite sex for sexual relations with the same sex. 
And let's just call it what it is, what the Bible says it is. We call that homosexuality. And this is what we're going to talk about for the next two weeks, from verses 24 to 27. Now, here's why I tell you this, because if you're a parent of small children, I want you to use wisdom in the next few weeks. Uh, just, I want you to use wisdom and discernment, discernment deciding if you want to make this a teaching time for your children, um, because we're going, to, we're going to teach this biblically from the Bible. Um, and we're going to get to the root of the problem, but we're going to address homosexuality. And I, I know that that topic can be painful sometimes, depending on where you are, depending on where your children are, depending on where their friends are. Um, and I know it can be very blunt, but I just wanted to give you a warning that the next two weeks, we're going to just teach the text. And I, I, pray for me, because I want to teach it faithfully. Um, a lot of times we teach on this topic out of context, and we really do a, uh, an injustice to the Bible. But we want a biblical worldview on these things, and so um, pray for me. Could you do that? And I also say that, okay, <laughs> because next week is Family Sunday. <laughs> so um, I-, I prayed a lot about it. I talked to our church a lot about it, and I thought over this week and even speaking with my wife that it's important that our children hear this from the pulpit. Because they're hearing it from public schools. They're hearing it from YouTube. And uh, I want to give them the truth from God's word about this. And so I thought that it's important that I address it from the pulpit. So pray for me, okay, if you can. But today our focus is on verses 21 through 23. If you have a copy of God's word, go ahead and open it. If you're not already there to Romans chapter 1. If you need a Bible, raise your hands and, uh, and we can get you one. We got one here. You got a Bible, Nikki? So can some of the guys get some Bibles here? Just keep your hands raised so we can get you the Word of God, get you a copy of the Word of God. Before I go there, I'm just going to wait till they pass them out. Keep, Keep your hand raised for me. Thank you, Beverly, here. Amen. So today our focus is on verses 21 through 23, and as I said a second ago, the first ungodly exchange that we will see that characterizes fallen human culture is the exchange of the glory of God for idols. Now I just want you to remember the context with me, I want you to track with me to where we've been and where we are right now. Romans chapter 1, Don just read it, Paul began to track this thought now and he began to give us the reality of of our dead state apart from Christ and he says this apart from the gospel he says for the wrath of God verse 18 if you have your Bibles for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth what truth is that this is the This is the universally revealed truth, general revelation. When we look out to nature, when we look at each other, when we look at all that God has created, we know that there is a God, right? But we suppress this truth, namely, specifically, we suppress the eternal power and divine nature of God. And in suppressing this truth, verse 21 says, people do not glorify God as God. Or give thanks to him. That's what it says in verse 21. So we suppress the truth. And by suppressing this truth, the outward action is we do not glorify God as God. Nor do we give thanks to him. And consequently, that means that we are without excuse against the wrath of God. God's wrath, friends, is just and it's holy because we have all the knowledge we need to worship Him. We have all the knowledge we need in general revelation when we look out into our world to worship Him and give thanks to Him. But we don't. We suppress the truth rather than giving thanks to God and glorify Him. Or maybe we could put it differently based on today's text. We can put it this way. That the unregenerate, the lost, the unrighteous, the ungodly 
they behold and know the glory of God offered them for their joy and their trust, and yet they exchange it for images. This response is the same suppressing and the same failure to glorify and thank God that we've seen in the last two messages from this paragraph. So what I want to do today is to just focus our attention on this ungodly, and I keep using the same adjectives, and I want to bring it home. I want to focus our attention on this ungodly, this sinful, this dark exchange of the glory of God for idolatry. So the name of my message this morning is simple. It's the glory of God exchanged for idols. It's the name of my message. But I want to mention something here that I think is important before I pray and get into our text. I want you to know that I, after reading this text over and over and over this week, I am sure that the reason Paul says anything about this exchange is not to fascinate our intellect. Y'all get what I'm saying? I don't think he writes this to fascinate our intellect, but rather he wants us to move from and flee from this exchange. And he wants us to help others to flee from this ungodly exchange. So this is not just to fascinate your intellect this morning. This is to cause us to look at our own lives, to look at the idolatry in our own lives, and to flee from it, and to repent from it, and to turn to Christ. Because this idolatry is pervading the culture, and it doesn't matter whether it's a primitive culture, it pervades primitive cultures, but also the modern world, it's pervaded our culture, and it's so clear. It is just so clear. And so before I get into the text, why don't you pray with me that God would just minister to our hearts, convict us, teach us this morning. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge you as the creator and the sustainer of all things. And God, we are in awe as the children of God that we get to call this creator and this sustainer Father because of the blood of Christ, because of the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, we need your spirit this morning. We need eyes to see, and only you can open up our eyes to see. We need ears to hear, and only you can give us ears to hear. God, what we know not this morning, teach us. What we have not this morning, give us. And what we are not this morning, Lord, by your Spirit, make us. Conform us to the image of Jesus. Save us, Lord, from this idolatry. May we turn to you, Lord, this morning. We acknowledge that your word is truth. It's the inspired, the very breath of God. It's authoritative. It's infallible. It's inerrant. It's sufficient. It's effective. It's the word of our God. So what I pray is that you would just sanctify us by this truth this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I have at least four observations that I would like to make from our text this morning. But but first, what I want to do is I just want to make sure... Um, that we all see the exchange itself in verse 23. If you look at verse 23 of Romans chapter 1 with me, I want to make sure we see the exchange itself happening in the text. It says that the ungodly and the unrighteous exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So what kind of exchange is this? Friends, let me submit to you that this is the exchange of God and His great glory, okay, for a pitiful, pathetic, miserable substitute. 
Now, this reality itself needs to be stressed this morning because the glory of God is the banner of the church, right? The glory of God is the banner of Restoration Church of Sanford. It's our favorite theme. As a matter of fact, when we started our Pray for Sanford on Thursday, we we made T-shirts, and on the T-shirts it says, To God be the glory. Because we didn't want people to mistake what we were doing. We didn't want the glory to God be the glory. As a matter of fact, at the end of our prayer service, our benediction, we all say together, to God be the glory. We're consumed with the glory of God. And we believe at Restoration Church of Sanford that the glory of God is the great unifying reality of the Bible and of the entire universe. Here's what I mean. All is springing from and flowing toward the glory of God. Or maybe I can put it this way. All that is, is for the glory of God. We can just remember it that way. All that is, is for the glory of God. Now hear me, friends. We live in an expressive, individualistic culture. Individualism has plagued the church. So now, instead of the church being about God and His glory, we make it all about us. It's called expressive individualism. And it's plagued everything. It's happened in the secular culture, and now it's brought into the church. And instead of being consumed with the glory of God, we are more concerned about what man thinks. So let me say this. I want us to set the record straight on this because of this expressive individualism. The ultimate value in the universe, my dear friends, is not the soul of man, but the glory of God. We have to make that point this morning, don't we? That the ultimate value in the entire universe is not the soul of man, but the glory of our God. And so it's important for us as a church to see texts like this and realize that this this theme, this emphasis, this value is not being laid upon the Bible, but as a matter of fact, it's coming from the Bible itself. That this theme of the glory of God is coming from the triune God himself. We're not laying it upon the Bible. It is the theme of the entire Bible, to God be the glory. So we get that. The ultimate value of the Bible and the universe is the glory of God. So now we're getting to the root problem of the passage if you haven't looked at it. Now we see here in our passage that two times in this passage, Paul says that the fundamental Bottom line, root problem with the human race has to do with what we make of the glory of God. So in verse 21, Paul says, if you all want to look at it with me, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him. Literally, it can be translated, they did not glorify Him as God. There we have it, don't we? That's the fundamental problem with the human race. What is it, Pastor Arthur? We do not acknowledge, we do not value, we do not treasure, we do not savor, we do not honor, we do not make much of the greatest value in the entire universe, namely the glory of God. And that's our inherent and natural sinful inclination. You know what it is? You know what the inherent and natural sinful inclination is for us? It's to rob God of His glory. Our natural sinful inclination is to say, what about me? We want to be the center of attention. We want the glory. So our natural sinful inclination is to rob God of His rightful glory. So in verse 23, Paul puts it in a different way by saying this. Claiming to be wise, love that. Claiming to be wise, 
Here's what happens. We become fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. So here lies the grave problem that the Bible's presenting to us time and time again. The great problem of the universe concerns what humans are making of the glory of God. And this reality, friends, this reality is the issue of your life. This is the issue of our culture. This is the issue of our century. This is the issue of all the nations of the world. You see, because when Paul reaches to describe the depths of man's sinful condition under the wrath of God, he does not first deal with the sexual sins of verses 24 to 27, or even the list of 21 sins in verses 29 to 31. He deals first with the fundamental problem. What do we make of the glory of God? That's a question for you. What do you make of the glory of God? Do you magnify the glory of God by treasuring it above all things? Or do you belittle the glory of God by preferring other things and exchanging the glory of God for created things? David, you're right. Brother David is right. He says, I have. We all have. And I don't know why we're saying it in the past tense, because it's surely in the present tense. And going to be in the future tense. And so, as we read through these four observations that I've made through the text, my prayer is that God this morning will awaken you a new love and a new reverence and a new desire for His glory alone. That we would be like the reformers, soli deo gloria. You know what that's, that's Latin for? Anybody? Glory to God alone. That's what they were consumed by. That's what they cared about. They wanted God to get all the glory. Soli Deo Gloria. We have some bookmarks, by the way, in the bookstore. If you want to pick some up to remind you during the week. But this must be the theme of our church. And I'm praying that God, through this word this morning, will awaken you this new love for his glory. So let us jump right into the first observation that I've made from our text. The first observation I would like to make in our text this morning is that the ungodly exchange of God's glory for images is always accompanied by futile thinking. Every time we exchange the glory of God for images, it's always accompanied by futile thinking. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But what happened? Y'all can interact with me now. We're not one of those quiet churches, right? We can, if you got your handkerchief, if you want to speak out loud, amen, let's do it. I want to make sure y'all are awake this morning. But what it says is, but they became futile in their thinking. What does futile mean here? Futile means exactly what it means, empty. They became empty in their thinking. They became vain in their thinking. They became useless in their thinking. You see, friends, God gave us, God gave human beings minds with the capacity to reason and imagine and speculate and think and ponder and meditate. Why? The question is why? Why did he give us that capacity? So that we might use all of those things to think about God, to speak about God, to praise God, and to devise things in the world which would honor God. That's why he gave us those things. And we see this purpose so vividly, and I know y'all are going to want to turn there. Daniel chapter 4. Can y'all turn there with me? Daniel chapter 4. We see this purpose so vividly in the story of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4, if you have your Bibles. God, the creator of all things, gave Nebuchadnezzar a mind and a might to effect change. But God uses Nebuchadnezzar's mind here and his might to build what we know as Babylon. But here's how Nebuchadnezzar took it. Here's, what, here's how Nebuchadnezzar 
view things from his perspective. Daniel chapter 4, verse 30. Here's what he says. Is not this great Babylon, which I, can y'all help me out, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of majesty. All right, let's just read it together, okay, because Don is the only one helping me preach this morning. All right, I'm so glad he's back. I think Brother David spurned him on. Y'all read it with me again. Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty. Now, how many of us have done this with a show of hands? If everybody doesn't show their hands today, I don't know, I'm a little worried. How many people... God has given us the ability, the talent, the the capacity to imagine, to think, to create. And after it's all said and done, we go, look what I have built. How many people have done that this morning? We all have. I have. How many people, at the when it's all said and done, we've said, I've done this with my power. I built this, and if we're honest before God, even some Christians, if they were honest before God, they would say, I didn't build this church for the glory of God. I built it for my glory. So what does God think about this? Well, God was so displeased. He's displeased with this. God was so displeased with Nebuchadnezzar's pride and his failure to use his mind to acknowledge God that he turned him into an animal. Because that's exactly how we're acting when we don't give God the glory. So God had to humble him. How low? Turning somebody into an animal is pretty low. Amen? Nobody's ever been there, I don't think. The Bible says he was driven from among men and he ate grass like an ox. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird claws. God humbled him and that's exactly what we need don't we we need to be humbled when we're in this place of idolatry and we think that we've built this and we've done this and it's for my glory it's right after that where God typically humbles us and then come the key words of Daniel chapter 4 verse 34 and then Daniel says oh at the end of the days I, Nebuchadnezzar, where did he lift his eyes, friends? He lifted his eyes to heaven, that is, towards God, right? And my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High. And I praised and honored him who lived forever. What's the point of this? When your eyes are Godward, your reason returns. Why does your reason return when your eyes are Godward? Because your mind, my dear friend, was not made for yourself. It was made for God and his glory. And when Nebuchadnezzar's reason returned, he uses it as God intended for him to use it. He blessed, he praised, he glorified the one who lives forever. This is why Paul says, when we exchange the glory of God, the concern for his glory, for images, our thinking, our speculations, they just become futile. They become meaningless. That's what the text means, right? That's what futile means. It means vain. It means empty. It means useless. And that's exactly what the mind becomes when it's no longer used to know God and to love God and to treasure and honor God. It becomes useless, vain. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter if you are the most brilliant scientist on the planet or an artist, or an engineer in the world, and you're the smartest of all engineers in the world, you're the most creative artist in the world, hear me, friends, everything you do with your mind minus God is futile, and it's empty, and it's vain. 
Everything you do with your mind minus God, it's empty. It's vain. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul brings home this point. Starting at verse 18, he says, Let no one deceive himself. (laughs) Somebody needs to hear that this morning. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. Uh Uh-oh. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. And what, what are they? They are futile. They're folly. So what's the lesson you got for us, Paul? So let no one boast in men. <laughs> not in yourself and not in anybody else. Friends, do not exchange God for other things. If you do it, just know that all your thinking will become futile and empty. And at the end of the day, it will not have a lasting, eternal significance. So the first observation of the text is when we exchange the glory of God for idols, our thinking becomes futile. And the second observation is that This exchange is always accompanied by a darkness of heart. Verse 21, it says, They became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were, what? Darkened. The question is this. Why is the heart darkened when people exchange the glory of God for other things? And the answer is that, isn't it? The answer is that the only light in the universe that can fill the human heart with light is the glory of God. Okay, let's listen to Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. This is what Jesus said. Jesus said that the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is what? Healthy, your whole body will be full of light. In other words, Jesus is saying, To us, friends, please don't miss this. Jesus is saying that there is no light-producing element in the body. All light comes comes from outside of ourselves. The eye must be good if any of this light is to get into the body and let the body see. And so it is with the heart and the spiritual light. Friends, God has designed our human hearts in such a way that only he can fill our dark and rebellious hearts with the light of his glory. There is no light producing element in the human heart. This is important. For our notes, there is no light producing element in the human heart. What Paul wants us to know by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is that all light comes from outside. Namely, it comes from the glory of God. Now this is why, now we can bring it full circle. This is why in John chapter 8, Jesus says, He is the spiritual light of the world, right? Whoever follows Him, He says, will not walk in darkness but they will have the light of life. Jesus is the spiritual light of the world, but the question is why? Because John 1.14 says, He is the glory as of the only Son from the Father. You see? Jesus is the glory of God. Paul has a great prayer in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, where he prays, that the eyes of the hearts of the Ephesian church, the church at Ephesus, he prays that their hearts, the eyes of their hearts, would be what? Enlightened. Why? Because he knows only the prayer hearing God can enlighten the dark heart. Only the prayer hearing God, friends, can enlighten our darkened hearts. That's why he says in 2 Corinthians, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, he says this, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We see that now? 
the only light in the universe that can bring light to this dark heart is the glory of God. So consequently, here's what this means. If we exchange the glory of God for other things, what do you think is going to happen? We're going to continue to walk in what? Darkness. So no matter how brilliant you are or how many fires you may build or how many candles you may light, our hearts will always be darkened when we exchange the glory of God for anything. First observation, we exchange the glory of God for idols. It's always accompanied by futile thinking. Secondly, when we exchange the glory of God for idols, it's always accompanied by a darkened heart. And the third observation is this, when we exchange the glory of God for idols, we feel that it is wise when we do it. We feel that it's it's the right decision when we do it. Here's what it says in verse 22. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. You see, friends, to the natural man, apart from grace and with a darkened heart, nothing seems more obvious than that it is wiser to design your own God than to take what you, are, what you have already been given. The darkened heart asks, could anything be more obviously wise than to make your own God? The advantages abound to a darkened heart. It shows how resourceful we are, how creative we are, how intellectual we are, how intelligent we are. It makes our ego feel good. But best of all, and really the bottom line of a rebellious heart, is that creating your own God makes you independent and it keeps you in control. And that's really what we're looking for, isn't it? We want to be the ones pulling the strings, don't we? In other words, what I'm saying is this. What the text is displaying for us is this. When we make our own gods, it lets us play God. And what could be wiser than the choice to be God? Hey, Satan said to Eve in the garden a very similar thing. This was what... He was proposing to Eve in Genesis 3, 5. It says, for God knows that when you eat of it, this forbidden tree, your eyes will be open and you will be like what? You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one what? Why? That's Romans 1, 22 right there. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Why do I give you that text? Because that's the way it was in the beginning, and that's the way it is right now. If you want to assume the role of God in governing your life, my dear friends, you're going to perceive this dark exchange, this idolatry, as the wisest decision you've ever made. That's how you're going to perceive it. But this leads me to my fourth observation, which is connected to my third observation. When we make this exchange, we think it's wise. But the reality is, is even if it looks wise, Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, it's just downright foolish. Paul says, you're claiming to be wise. When they make this exchange, we claim to be wise, but yet we become fools. What Paul is saying here in this final observation is that no matter how wise it seems this morning to exchange God's glory for idols, friends, it's just downright foolish. And I love the fact that Paul didn't hold any punches here in this verse. And sometimes that's exactly what we need, right? We just need to be looked in the eye and say, hey, Arthur, that's just foolish. How how many times, friends, how many times did did someone who was older than you and wiser than you, a parent or a grandparent, look at you and said, I I know your decision that you made. I know you think it's good, but it's foolish. 
How many times as a parent or as a grandparent have we looked at our grandchildren, have we looked at our children and said, hey, I hear you, I see you, but it's foolish. Some of us are like, I'm getting it from my spouse right now. Paul is saying, friends, that it is foolish to create your own God and be your own God. It is foolish to lean on futile speculations and to walk in darkness. But the question is why? Why is this dark exchange of God for images so foolish? Well, Paul gives us at least three answers in our text. I'm only going to have time for two, and then we're going to leave the other one for next week, okay? Let's just take a look at the two because we only got so much time. You know I'm long-winded. I'm sorry. Let's look at the first observation. Paul shows here that the exchange of God's glory for idols is foolish by emphasizing the infinite difference in value between what you trade away and what you get in its place. Here's what I mean. The glory of God, please hear me. The glory of God, friends, is of infinite value. And what you get in the exchange is infinitely small by comparison. Look how he shows this truth in verse 23. He says, in their folly, they exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal man. Don't miss those words. I like the King James translation where it says that the ungodly and the unrighteous, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to a corruptible man. Literally, the text reads this way. They exchanged the glory of the uncorruptible, that's in the Greek, it's athratos, the uncorruptible God, imperishable God, immortal God, for the likeness, for the likeness of an image of corruptible, thratos, man. This is very, very important. You're not going to want to miss this because he's making a point here. What we have to understand here is that man himself is already according to Genesis 1.27, an image of God and not God, right? He's an image of God, not God. But that's not what the exchange of God gets. No, not even that. It says, rather, it's for an image of a what? A man. Do you see that? So the exchange is not even for the image of God, but for the image of man. And not even that. Rather, he says, we exchange God's glory for a likeness of an image of man who, who himself is an image. This is important because he's piling up words here for a reason. Why is Paul piling up words like this? He is emphasizing here in our text the infinite difference in value between the real deal and the copy. And y'all know when you go to a store and maybe you buy real sneakers or a real jersey, you can tell the real one from the fake one, right? And then you can tell the real one from the fake one from the fake one from the fake one at the flea market, right? So this is what he's doing. He's saying this, when you make this exchange, even for the best thing you can think of, namely for yourself, for man, not even to mention animals, what he's saying here is that you are bartering God for the image of an image of an image, or maybe let me put it to you this way. You are selling the original masterpiece for a copy of a copy of a copy. Jose, you know about sneakers back there, right? You can tell the difference, right? How crazy is that thought? Friends, we, we live in a dying and sick culture where you will hear and read the boast, not the shameful confession, but the boast that image is everything. Right? This is the culture we live in. Image is everything. But Christians, I just want to exhort you this morning. Don't get sucked in. Lost friends, don't get sucked in. Because the Bible says that the glory of God is everything. And to exchange him for anything is to lose the greatest treasure in the world for an image of an image of an image. Now do you see why Paul says this exchange is futile and dark? And even more than that, it is just downright foolish. 
And he wants us to flee from it. He, the Bible is pointing us to, to rescue people from this lie. And to not be afraid as Christians to just call it what it is. Idolatry. That's the first thing Paul shows us in the text. The second thing I want to point out to you is this. The reason why he says it's foolish. But Paul shows us that this dark exchange is foolish by observing here that the glory of God is immortal and man is what? Mortal, right? This is what he says in verse 23. I think we all get what that means. Mortal just simply means perishable. But he's saying that we're comparing the perishable for the imperishable. Y'all know Isaiah chapter 40 verses 6 through 8. Listen to how Isaiah puts it. He says, a voice says cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. And all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass, what? Withers. The flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are like what? The grass withers. The flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. Praise the Lord. And so what he's saying is this, friends. If you value other things more than God, if your life is really driven by any other value, then you exchange the imperishable for the perishable. Here's what you're really doing. You are trading the diamond for a peach forgotten in the back of your refrigerator. You are trading the ruby for a banana sitting in the sun. You are trading a bar of gold for a bolt rusting in the rain. Foolish. So I leave you with an exhortation this morning. I pray that you see it. My dear br brother and sister in Christ this morning, I exhort you to count everything else in your life, to count everything else in this world as rubbish compared to God and His glory. Let's do as Paul did as he looked at this, this life that is like a vapor, like Don said. And he said this, after all of his accomplishments, after all that he did, he looked at his life, and here's what he said in Philippians chapter 3. He said, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, friends, I count everything. Every, did he just say some things? No, no, but no, no, these few things are good. No, he says, indeed, I count everything as loss. Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Then he says, for his sake, for the name of Christ, for God and his great glory, I have suffered the loss of all things. Now, he didn't end the sentence there, did he? He says, for the sake of the glory of God, I have suffered the loss of all things. But now that I look back on that... <laughs> I see that in light of eternity, and I, come, I just look at that, and I just count it all as rubbish. And I count it all as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Is that how you look at your life this morning? Whatever gain you have, you count it all as loss for the sake of just knowing Christ. And I'm not just saying knowing him on Sunday mornings, you know. I'm talking about really knowing him intimately. Where he can speak his word into your life and correct you and draw you towards repentance. So that you might live a life that brings him honor and glory. Are you willing to do whatever you need to do to be holy as God is holy? To live a life that's honoring to him? Some of us need to let go of some things in our life this morning if we're honest. And I'm not just talking about the people that are at the bottom. I'm talking about the people that are at the top and everything in between. Let the world call living for God, church. Let the world call living for God in his glory folly. Let them do it. 
We're strangers. We're aliens in this world. But God says living for me, God says living for me and for my glory, it's not worthless. It's not a loss. It's not futile. It's not folly. As a matter of fact, it's what you were created for. And by the way, it's not only what you were just created for, but it is the sole pursuit that will satisfy your soul. You can go out and try whatever you want. Build your own kingdoms. Go ahead. Build your businesses. Achieve everything you want in your career. But at the end of the day, when you're in your hospital bed and you only have days to live, hours to live, I'll tell you one thing is for sure. None of that's going to satisfy your soul. As I was sitting by David this week, and even a few weeks ago, I was sitting with him, and all he could talk about was God and his glory and how he's been so good to him and how he's been there even when he turned his back on God. He was there. He was there. And towards the end of of, of right now where he's at, he's sick. He's not doing well. He's not the David we all know. But he said, man, this last three years, they've been full because I've lived for God. My heart is satisfied. I have a picture. Do you have that picture in there? It's a black and white picture. Do you all see it up there? Does anybody know who this cheerful fella is? (laughs) He looks cheerful, doesn't he? This is the Secretary of State. His name is William Seward. He was the Secretary of State in the 1800s, I should add. And this man, William Seward, Secretary of State in 1867, he's the guy that helped America buy Alaska from the Russians. You know how much? He bought Alaska from the Russians for $7.2 million. Alaska. And at that time, people thought he was nuts. They They ridiculed the man. I, I, was, I was like, man, if there was Twitter back then, he would have been decimated. And people ridiculed this man. They even called this exchange Seward's Folly. That's what they called it. How can a man exchange $7 million for ice? Well, let me just update you. In the last 150 years, Alaska has yielded billions upon billions of dollars in resources to America. Why do I tell you that? Because things are not what they seem. So here's my last exhortation to you, and I mean this with all my heart. I plead that you'll open up your eyes this morning. I plead that this morning that you will exchange idols for God. And if right now, if there there are idols in your life If you're playing the God of your own life, I pray that this morning when we go into prayer, you will have a time of confession and repentance and calling out to him. And my exhortation to you is this, friends. My exhortation is this. Whatever you got to do this morning, whatever you got to exchange, do it. Because God is worthy. And that's why you were created. And if you want your heart to be satisfied... It starts with that. Give him his rightful praise. Honor him. Worship him. Give thanks to him. Make sure he is the center of your life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you remind us that we're so quick to exchange your great glory for a copy of a copy of a copy And Lord, it is vain, it is futile. And even more than that, our hearts just become darkened when we exchange your glory for anything else. And rather than living a life that you've called us to live and created us to live, when we exchange your glory for anything else, we live in darkness. We live with our brokenness and we try to put our lives back together on our own, but they're just... It's not possible apart from God. So I pray that this morning, if if there's anyone in this room who has never come to you and said, Jesus, I repent of my sin. I'm a sinner. I've worshipped idols. I've made myself an idol. If that's you this morning, 
or maybe you're watching online, I pray that you get before God right now in your seat and say, I repent of my sin. And I acknowledge that I need a Savior this morning to save me from my sin. And the Bible says that only Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. And only Jesus can grant us eternal life with Him. And if there's anybody in this place who would like to take a step of faith in that direction, I pray that they wouldn't leave here without making it known to me or anybody with a badge so we can come alongside you so that we can begin to live the life that God has created us to live in light of eternity. And for the Christian, Lord, may we not compromise. May we stand on solid ground. May we see this morning that your glory is of infinite value compared to what we trade in its place. May we live for it. May we be consumed by it. May may our desire be to pursue you and your glory for all of our days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us stand to our feet if we can for our benediction. We just read this together from the screen. When it's on the screen, just say amen. I only got like three amens. Amen. Amen. Let us read our benediction together. By the Holy Spirit, may we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Christ be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. God bless you, church.